Welcome to today's talk, Building an Internal Developer Platform on AWS. My name is Carlos Santana. I'm an EKS Specialist Solutions Architect with EKS, and I help customers in AWS to build platforms on top of EKS and using things like GitOps, Kubernetes, and uh, control planes. So we start with improving uh, the platform. In terms of platform engineering, you want to accelerate software delivery. Uh, the first thing is to identify the bottlenecks. Anything else is just an illusion, as you can see here. We have to focus on finding what are the bottlenecks that we have, not to create a new platform, but improve the current one that we have. And you will see how we do that today. So we start with the CICD pipeline evolution. This is kind of like where everybody starts or everybody has a baseline where you have a developer that wants to build an application, deploy an application, and use things like cloud services uh, to run the application in something like AWS. So we have different type of CICD pipelines, and it starts from the point of view of Git. The developer saves his code, his configuration in Git, and then uses a CICD pipeline, which is, in other terms, a workflow engine. Things like Jenkins have been around for a while. GitHub Actions are new. In AWS, we have code, code pipeline, code build that you can use to develop uh, this. And all of them do kind of the same thing. They have an authentication model where you have to authenticate the Git to authenticate to get files from Git and push it to the platform. You have to build an abstraction to build applications. So this could be like building a zip file for a Lambda or it could be a container for Lambda or something like Kubernetes or ECS or App Runner. Once you have artifacts in terms of like saving the Docker containers or saving the zip file or saving the libraries, you will put them into an artifact repository. And that the next step is that you want to have enforcement on when you deploy, you want to make sure that you have some guardrails that you, you have in place some policies that you have saved for the organization that you extract those policies and apply them at build time and deploy time. And then comes the infrastructure automation. How do we deploy and how do we uh, roll a new version of the application, like things like blue green. In terms of deployment, you have to have an audit process where maybe you are required to have a Jira ticket or some type of ticketing system that gets open to track what are the changes that are being done to the production system. And that's something that is very typically in enterprise systems where they have to track everything that goes into production. So they have audits that they save and, and save into some store to save the state of the audits that have happened in the past. Then comes the blue green, where you have the current version out there and you want to swap that version and start rolling the new version that you have either a fix or a new feature. And that way you have to save the state. What is the version that is in production? What is the version that is in pre-prod? What is the version that is in staging and development? Not necessarily development, but pre-prod and prod. So you have to have a way of like, if you did the swap, save that state of like, everybody knows that the current version is the one that is saved in some type of state. And then it goes into the deployment. So this is the typical process that it goes for every CICD pipeline. So you are, are you're doing processes, you're checking boundaries, and you're saving information into different uh, state repositories. And this is this is the very high level of what just is, we just discuss we this discuss is um, the developer push code to Git or changes or configuration it uses the app or the API to get into the system. It goes to the process and that state is, is safe and you push to, to uh, production in terms of here is AWS. But that's not the whole picture for most enterprise customers. We have the, the next level, which is the abstraction for infrastructure, app, the infrastructure for the app, let's say. You need a database, you need storage, you need queues, you need streams. You go to the same process. You have an app, you have a console, maybe you open a ticket for another system uh, or another team to take charge of deploying that infrastructure that is required for the developer. Same process, similar process that everything is safe on a state and then you have your uh, infrastructure for your app uh, deploy. Then the app and the infrastructure are working together to satisfy the service that is being uh, hand, uh, served to customers. 
Then comes networking. Not saying that necessarily all these things happen in order, um, but usually is the requirements. Um, networking, security, AIM. Uh, these are aspects that will go through the same process to create an abstraction, to create roles, to create policies, uh, have automation to create them, to, to create those uh, roles with the policies necessary to create security groups, firewalls between instances, ACLs, and so on. So that would be a team or a process that is knowledgeable and experts on the system. So they're in charge of network and security. In large enterprises, there's a dedicated team to have that have this. So any configuration that is done to the system for the satisfying the application is saved again into a state uh, repository, some type of state. The last one is in very large organizations, what they do is they create different accounts. It could be for business units. It could be for different projects, but that's a way that they have isolation and also have control of all these applications and also go, can go beyond a limit of limits that are imposed on a single account. And they create something called a landing zone, which is a consistent way of deploying a baseline. All the accounts look the same. All the accounts are treated the same. And then that way, all the accounts is easy to manage for consistency. Again, you have some type of system, either you say automated or manually, that everything goes through a certain tools to automate it. And then you save that information in a state. So as you can see, CICD is not just as building a simple application, either Python or Java, and deploying the code. In Dutch enterprises, there's different layers of uh, requirements that have to be met. And sometimes these requirements are handled by different teams. So this is another view of that, how this looks like. To the developer, he's working with Git, he's working with tickets, maybe he's working with a UI to get his application or project deployed into production or different environments, or get an environment where he can do testing uh, before production and then uh, one that is for production. So all these aspects of application, application infrastructure, networking, security, uh, landing zones, all of them are saving the state in different places, but at the end of the day, everything gets deployed into the runtime, which is AWS. Once it's deployed in AWS, then you have to have a system or something that can run continuously checking that the desired state that was deployed is consistent and is compliance. All this information is saved in the state. And if something changes uh, that is not a desired state, then all these systems are emitting events. So you have some type of boss or some type of storage that you're emitting events, and then you're monitoring on those events of things that change or things that um, get worse or things that are either changed by humans or changed by the system. You have to have uh, monitoring in place. And then if something happens that is the configuration is not compliance, you need to alert someone or alert a system. In some cases, some organizations, they have Lambda functions that are very easy to uh, configure and write that when they something is not in compliance, can alert it based on events. And then the Lambda will go back to the runtime and make the configuration to make sure that it's back into compliance. Some organizations are not there yet in terms of their automation. So what they do is they use something like per your duty and page a operator person that the operator would need to handle the whoever is on duty will handle the change uh, into the system, either using an API, a tool, or the console. And that's the process that most customers will go through as they grow uh, the number of applications and the number of accounts. Um, as you can see here, that's one developer, but developers belong to a team and organizations have different teams for uh, for creating the services. And then as we saw before, these la different layers can be done, uh, usually are done typically in an enterprise environment by uh, different teams. So the uh, CICD system uh, team is in charge of application and infrastructure. Um, the uh, And that the team for development will go through that for CICD. If they need infrastructure, they will go to a different team to get infrastructure and that's uh, that the overlap of our responsibility now, the infrastructure team needs to work with the CICD team because it needs to handle the infrastructure and the runtime. Same thing happens again, 
uh, when you're deploying an application, there's certain um, requirements depending on how your app needs to connect to different system. It needs to work with uh, network system, uh, network team. And in case, uh, for example, um, going from different regions, different VPCs, or going on-premise to the cloud. And the next one is uh, security, which covers the networking accounts and that continuous compliance that I said. The team will also go there uh, to that team and discuss their requirements and see how they can go move forward. At this point, there's too many teams and and uh, working with some all these different teams. So they need, you need a, a project manager to handle kind of like the request of um, uh, uh, service tickets, for example, or uh, automation, or uh, usually it's tickets. And then as more teams grow, and then the, uh, each team does more applications, uh, they start going through the product manager. Product manager will pro give priority of what are the most important things, or depending on the size of the request, it will it will route the request to the team that will handle that. And then this happens also in terms of business units. Some enterprise customers, uh, what they do is they have um, just not just teams, but they have business units either because they're large, different locations, or maybe they did an acquisition. The same thing, these new business units will need to go through this project manager that is handling all the infrastructure provisioning and deployment requirements. And again, giving priority to the most important things and depending on the size and depending on the critical aspects of the request and so on. They, so they start growing. So what happens is they kind of get out of control because the team uh, that is handling the request is not enough, or it's not fast enough, or it doesn't have automation to handle all of them. So at this point, they get some. They have some challenges in their hand. They have some uh, maybe automation or DevOps glues um, that they have uh, trying to do in house to build it in house, and it's taking some time. There's no single source of truth, as you saw. There was state here, state there, in different aspects. Every team would save their state in different places. Um, it makes it very difficult to collaborate, and also for the teams or the developers going through a different UI or different process, depending what are the requirements or depending which teams they're working with, they will need to use uh, different APIs or different UIs or different ticketing systems. So this is our kind of the challenges that as organization are trying to create automation and a standard way, a consistent way for the development teams to uh, build their apps they're, they're having. So this results in a very difficult and uh, cognitive um, load for developers to start thinking like, if I need to do X, I need to go to the system. If I need to do Y, I need to go to this other system. Also creates, as we saw at the beginning, this is where the bottlenecks are happening. And this is a one way that you can identify what are the bottlenecks uh, that you have, depending on the team size, depending on the requirement. And this creates a fragmentation that then you see that there's not a consistent way of onboarding applications uh, into the system and that creates uh, friction and also uh, creates delay on delivering the projects. So we moved into platform engineering. So these are the challenges that we try to address with platform engineering. So we move from the, the system that we have was a homegrown uh, DevOps crew or grew DevOps to offering capabilities uh, to these teams and then having a platform framework to offer the capabilities in a consistent way. So one way of seeing this is that the teams uh, will go and consume the capabilities out of the platform. The feature requests um, will go through a different pipeline that is requesting the platform engineers to enhance the platform that is offering the capabilities. And again, these capabilities are around that CI/CD process for the different areas, like it could be networking, the accounts, the infrastructure, the apps. But it becomes capabilities that now the business units, the developers, and the and the app teams are consuming, and then they go through uh, the system and not through a project manager or not a ticketing system that is manually. The ticketing system and request will go is something that you will go through to request that for the platform to be enhanced, but it's for everyone. It's not a single request for a single team. But the, again, uh, the platform team is building a framework to provide the capability. So when there's um, capabilities that are missing, usually developers find a way or the app team finds a way because they have to 
develop their project. So what do they do? They build their own. Uh, so they want to build these other capabilities that are not in the platform. So you end up with a second platform or a third platform. So to avoid that, you have to choose to create a platform that can remove the bottleneck. So if you have bottlenecks, uh, the teams will create their own platform. And then inside your organization, you have the platform that you're building for everyone and then other ones spawning up because the one that you have, you're not providing capabilities. You're not large enough or fast enough for automation to provide the capabilities. So you're kind of like the same way that you were before, but a little bit better with these corner cases or corner teams. So what you can do is plug them into the system, collaborate with them and telling them, we already have a platform framework or a platform system that is extensible. So you they can also work on composing or extending through plugins or compositions to extend and offer more capabilities. And they work together into a single repository or a single library or a single framework. And that's a way that they can collaborate. So this facilitates the teams to either use the capabilities that are there that everybody's benefiting, but also create new capabilities working with the platform team um, to offer it for everyone. That way the platform team can offer services, um, capabilities as a service, and there's better collaboration, accelerating and scaling the, the organization forward that they can have uh, applications onboarded uh, faster. So in terms of platform framework, I made it very generic and very high level uh, abstractions, but there's open source projects. There's also vendor projects, but in this case, let's look at an open source project that we can use as a framework to build this platform. And you can see here, um, these are the capabilities that we're looking. So this is where Kubernetes come into place. Kubernetes as the platform framework. Kubernetes is a con the control plane of Kubernetes can be used because it provides that API that we were seeing that then also has uh, authentication that is the uh, uh, role-based access, access control. It has your mutation admissions that it can go through webhooks and controllers to enforce configuration, desired configuration or standards that developers don't have to worry about. It can validate schemas to make sure that you are having the right configuration or linting or making sure that the configuration matches uh, uh, the requirements. Um, then the validation webhooks is making a decision through policies if, if they're going to allow something to go through or not allowed to go through. And this is how you check for compliance. And then in terms of state, this is where you're going to be saving the state, um, typical Kubernetes using uh, etcd. So you're using the control plane, not for containers or running applications, but as a platform framework or programming model to build a platform framework for your platform platform engineering capabilities to offer them those capabilities as a product internally. And then the, the, as a state changes in Kubernetes, this is native features in Kubernetes. Anything that changes in the system goes to the SED and then that triggers the controllers to reconcile, either configuring the systems uh, in the API outside Kubernetes to match the desired state that is in SCD. In this case, SCD can be updated through the Kube API uh, that is pushed through Git uh, using GitOps, and we'll see that in a second. Uh, in terms of a large ecosystem, if you build a platform framework using Kubernetes, then you can leverage your skills uh, on Kubernetes and also the ecosystem. So you can start with the simple uh, ones that come out of Kubernetes, in this case, in EKS, or any um, uh, typical Kubernetes system, which is a load balancer, uh, PVCs, external DNS, those are typical things that you configure with controllers and configure the systems that for the apps that run in Kubernetes. Then you go into Argo and Kiverno that allows you to deploy the applications and make sure they're compliant. And then you can use something like ACK, AWS, controllers for Kubernetes from AWS that you want to have Kubernetes resources, reconcile them into the into AWS managed services and also cross planes, which we'll be looking uh, in, in a second uh, as an example of using compositions or claims to provisions those API um, in AWS. And you can go as deeper as creating your operator with something like your builder, operator SDK, or custom controllers. So let's look at the abstractions that we mentioned before when we mentioned abstractions. In typical Kubernetes, 
when you deploy a container uh, using pods, you define, you don't define deploy a pod, you define a deployment. That's an abstraction that then goes into replica sets. Those replica sets will have is an abstraction on pods, and then the, the pods will handle uh, the containers. So you work at different levels of abstraction. So what about if we won't want to do blue green? That could be a new abstraction where you have managing the different replicas and do rollouts. So we have an abstraction here that we just want to see do uh, blue green. But this blue green is for an app. So you can have an abstraction of something called an app um, that has, you want to have blue green, and then that will manage the replica sets. That's an abstraction that you compose in Kubernetes. Um, this app will have an ingress, you have uh, traffic coming in, and then you have this uh, app may need um, a bucket, for example, to store files. Um, and that's, those are the three things that, that are, you can say is a comp composition or composable abstractions that the app needs these three things to be complete. And also, uh, as I mentioned before, what about if the organization requires you to have tickets? So in this case, you can automate the creation of the ticket the update of the ticket as you do blue green deployments, the ticket can be updated. So you can still satisfy that requirement of having the ticket in place for change control and change management. The same thing happens with the environment. So apps get deployed into an environment and you can have a app associated with an environment or an environment associated with multiple apps. In this case, an environment can be composed from an account and that account will have a VPC VPC will have subnets. Um, that environment can include an EKS cluster, and then the EKS cluster has their node group. So you're creating abst um, abstractions and composing uh, solutions, and in this case, creating a composition for an environment. And we go back to the ticket system of having a uh, change management control. The automation can be in charge of creating the ticket or updating an existing ticket. Uh, when changes happen in the life cycle of that deployment. Now that, that CICD is using Kubernetes uh, resources. So as you can see here, you can also associate the app to the environment, and then you have a full view of all the things that are required to deploy an application. So not necessarily you have to put everything in the app, but you can have two things be composed into one, the app and the environment, and have a high level, uh, more high level uh, abstraction of what is the project uh, and the project requirements. Building uh, controllers in Kubernetes is comes from the very basic concept of watchers, where you watch etcd as system and controllers change uh, etcd, and then you react on them, and then you check if that desired state that is in etcd matches the current state that is available inside Kubernetes or outside Kubernetes. Like I mentioned, it could be AWS APIs and making sure that is there. This is the, the most simple example that I can show in terms of uh, an implementation of a controller. And a controller can be written in any language using different frameworks. Like I can mention operator framework or group builder or using uh, high level frameworks that already come with CRDs like ACK or Crossplane. So this is uh, a typical scenario where you use, can use GitOps for infrastructure, meaning that as you put files in Git, uh, the GitOps process will reconcile those desired configurations into AWS resources. In this case, you see in number one that uh, files get pushed into Git. Argo CD is a, Git, um, a GitOps system that will watch those changes in, in those files in, in Git and then push them into the Kube API server. The Kube API server will go through the lifecycle hooks, in this case, admission control, checking with Kubernetes or OPA in terms of um, doing um, mutation and validation. And then if those get passed, and then it will be stored, the state will be stored in etcd. So what you did was transform the files that are the desired state from Git into etcd. That will trigger the tenants and the controllers that will react on it to then create the infrastructure. So if the desired state is to create an, a database like RDS, the controller will create the, the database in, in AWS. It will take a few minutes, 
get the status and then the, as the status changes that status comes back into the control and you can get that status from scd using things like kubectl or kubectl or just a rest api to kubernetes and you can see that information in kubernetes that projection of the aws apis so let's take a look at a demo i'll move into a high level um, architecture so I have a EKS cluster here that I uh, deploy using Terraform, using the GitOps bridge. Uh, this deploys an EKS cluster, deploys Argo CD and nothing else. Um, it configures the metadata that it needs into an Argo CD secret and then Argo CD manages it itself. It deploys crossplane and all the um, EKS blueprints add-ons. And this stage, the system is ready to deploy um, the infrastructure. So what we want to do is uh, I have an example here of uh, a pla the book uh, Platform Engineering on Kubernetes from my friend and book author Mauricio Salantino. I run a Kubernetes book club every Friday from a CNCF. And this is a book that we recently uh, review. So in this case, it has a, a conference app uh, that has a UI agenda CFP. So it's a microservices written in uh, I, in different languages, uh, it's a polyglot application and it needs states, things like Art Redis, Kafka, SQL, and then notifications, it uses a, a microservice. So you can deploy all these out of uh, an environment. So we're going to look at a cross-plane environment that is a YAML file that we're going to put in, in YAML, uh, in Git, and that will trigger a vCluster. vCluster is a project that you can encapsulate and isolate in a Kubernetes cluster inside a host cluster like EKS and everything will be encapsulated there and deployed there. The second um, uh, composite that I'll be doing in Crossplane is Team A Environment AWS. And this one will deploy the microservices, agenda, CFP, and users, but will not deploy the Redis, Kafka, and, and SQL database inside Kubernetes. In this case, this is uh, a pre-prod environment, and we're going to do, uh, with cross-playing, we're going to deploy the Redis, the MSK, which is uh, Kafka serverless, Amazon RDS, and a Lambda that will be uh, used by the services. So in this case, this part runs in Kubernetes, and this part are managed services that you are leveraging from AWS. And the last one um, is, this one, which is Team A Environment ECAS. In this case, I'm deploying in a different account. And so just uh, as an example, in a different account, I'm deploying a full ECAS cluster. And within that ECAS cluster, I'm deploying the app. And then the managed services or backend services are being used, um, uh, again, like RDS, uh, MSK, and RDS. And it could be that this cluster is, one cluster could be in one region, and another cluster is located in a different regions because the application is deployed in, in two regions. So let's take a look at, um, one second. Let's move into what we have here. See, we have some code in here. So I have uh, an environment where I have uh, the composition. So I have a, a infrastructure as code using the EKS blueprints with the GitOps bridge. And then I have a folder called GitOps. I have add-ons where I deploy all my add-ons using uh, the GitOps bridge with um, AWS application, uh, Argo application sets, I have open source. But in this case, I just deploy cross-plane um, and Argo CD. The next aspect is uh, workloads. So in workloads, what I deployed was a um, cross-plane compositions. So in this case, I have cross-plane compositions for local, which is the, that first environment which I deployed. This one will deploy with uh, compositions, will deploy the local uh, Postgres database. This is um, the Redis using the Redis database, the Redis, uh, sorry, Helm chart, and then Kafka using the Kafka 
Helm chart. So this is the one that is for development that everything is deployed in Kubernetes, uh, fast to, to deploy and easy to tear down and then do kind of unit tests or every PR pull request that comes in, you can deploy one of these and it would should take a few, a few minutes to deploy. Uh, then we have the um, compositions and in the compositions, I have the AWS one. So I have this one that would deploy an RDS instance here. This is um, a the managed resource. And then this is the configuration that you will put. And this is an abstraction. So the platform team will put here the configuration that is typically done, or it can come from the composite. I have the same thing for Redis, creating a cache cluster using Elastic Cache uh, with its configuration. And then the managed broker uh, Kafka with its configuration. In terms of cross-plane, um, these are the compositions that you create. And when you offer to the developers are X, um, CRDs, and this, these CRDs are auto-generated in cross-plane using something called composite, composite resource definitions, XRDs. And what you're doing here is creating a database uh, CRD uh, where the user just specified the minimum set of information. For example, what is the size? Could be a teacher size, small, medium, or large, and then you convert that into the instance size of the database. The same thing for the environment of using, uh, this is this is the same API either for SQL or the key, key value uh, Redis. Um, and then this is the one for Kafka, it's a message broker. So you'll be passing the information about that message broker, and this is another CRD that you're creating in, and then you'll be creating the environment. And this is what we're going to deploy, which is the environment, meaning the whole application of the web, um, the, the conference app with all the microservices. And then we'll have two implementations for that. We'll have one composition for um, environment, we have one for AWS, and then we have one for the development. So if you ask for a development uh, type, this will deploy uh, all the services inside that big cluster. If you're creating the one that is type AWS, it will deploy the microservices, but all the databases, the Redis, Kafka, and SQL will be Amazon RDS, Elastic Cache Redis, and then uh, Kafka MS, Amazon MSK uh, serverless. So I have a folder here where I have an environment and I have team A, AWS. So in this case, this is this is one we'll put side by side. So you can see then side by side. Uh, one second. Let's see. So I have one says type development. And then one says type AWS. So I created a branch. Um, I have the files here and I think I pushed them already. So go to GitHub. I have an issue here that I open saying that I want two environments, one with development, one pre-prod. I created a pull request creating those environments. So I have the two files that I'll be creating those two V clusters, one with everything and one with the microservices pointing to Amazon uh, services. Uh, one second. And then let's, uh, in a real scenario, somebody would review it and then merge it. So in this case, this is a demo, uh, we'll merge it. So this is merge. In this case, we go here. If I refresh, I should suddenly see the two environments. So I have the two environments syncing. If I go to Kubernetes, I should see the environment. I should say kubectl cube get environment. I should see in a second two environments. So that's syncing and it takes a while. 
let's see one second so we see now the environments I have team A uh, AWS team A dev if we go to the the environment and we check the environment that you have the environment so one the environment one is already a uh, provision and then uh, the AWS since it takes a while uh, to provision the the environment um it will take a while to do that so i'll stop and then i'll come back to uh the environment in the in the console so i'll stop and then come back and give it like uh 10 minutes so by the magic of so we're we're back and we check uh we're going to check the console so in this case i have redis created i have the RDS uh, created and I have MSK created. So it created the, the three environments. Uh, and that way we have our um, applications uh, deploy. I have the application with everything inside, the other one here, and then um, I will deploy this, um, I'll deploy this one later. Um, that will deploy the whole EKS. This one takes around 10 minutes, so I will not do it now. But as you can see, as we push more environments, you can get them, you can destroy them very easy, everything from uh, GitHub. So if we go back to the presentation, as you saw here, um, we had Kubernetes uh, people in the different teams on the left side, you have all the capabilities that the teams are offering. On the right side, we have the developers, also consumers uh, like the command line SDK dashboard using Kubernetes as the API. So this here, the solution is open source, uh, using open source like Kubernetes to build a platform, creating a framework, single source of truth being Git, and then offering Kubernetes as an API to get to provision infrastructure. In this case, we reduce the cognitive load for, for developers, just takes a couple of YAMLs or a Helm chart, for example, to put it alongside with their code and everything gets deployed in a dev environment, everything's in or pre-prod staging or prod, everything is deployed in AWS, which you need the performance, the security of the cloud and that increase development uh, going forward and create something that is cohesive. Best practices as you saw here, there's many of them. The first one is do not create a new platform. Involve, evolve or improve the current one that you have with capabilities uh, moving forward so that you're getting started. Just offer small things like an S3 bucket or a database using Kubernetes. In this case, we have the difference here between DevOps and platform engineering. DevOps approach is more software development, uh, engineering, platform engineering acts to creating environments. Uh, platform engineer focus on creating the tools and the framework. Devo uh, DevOps focus on the lifecycle, getting apps out the door and many more. In this case, this is where we were, where this is this joint effort to create infrastructure. Developer needs to work with ticketing system, Terraform and YAML. And then now we go to a cohesive implementation using Kubernetes uh, for everything, deploying um, from YAML the configuration um, and their code in Git. I want to say thank you. My name is Carlos Santana. You can reach me in my email, LinkedIn, Twitter, or X. Uh, and I also am a uh, organizer for the Meetup Kubernetes Book Club. We'll be doing the CKA. We already did the Builder. So reach out in the CNCF. I'm a CNCF ambassador. I'm here to help. So I hope you enjoyed this talk and we'll see you along. Thank you.